Um, well, thank you first of all to everyone for joining us today for this webinar um, from the Ed, um, understanding a bit more about the impact of social groups. Um, my name is Phoebe. Um, I volunteered um, in Athens um, with a project um, back in November of 2018. Um, Colette, obviously, here is um, field coordinator for Refugee Ed. And Dan as well, um, who will also be speaking, um, has also volunteered in Athens. Um, both Dan and I are from a teaching background as well. Um, so this is just a quick look at the schedule for the next hour or so. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Colette, who's going to um, give a brief overview of the asylum process and some of the kind of timelines and context of um, the refugees um, who are in Greece at the moment. Um, I will then spend a little bit of time talking about my experiences volunteering um, with a project in um, Athens, followed by Dan, who will do the same, talking about his experiences um, volunteering in a different context in Athens. Um, and then we will end with a kind of joint Q&A session, as I mentioned before. If you do have any kind of technical issues as well, do pop um, those in the chat and we'll kind of keep, um, keep monitoring um, that as well throughout the calls. Um, just really quickly before I hand over to Colette then, um, we're just going to ask everyone to do a kind of initial reflection. So if you've got a pad and a pen in front of you, that'll be a um, question. <laughs> um, so we're just going to ask everyone, first of all, to think about what your kind of initial reflections are about what you think it would be like to volunteer on the ground um, in Greece with a local organisation working with refugees. So I'm just going to ask you to spend a couple of minutes um, putting some of these ideas down onto paper um, or onto your typing if you prefer. Thinking about what you think some of the challenges might be, what your expectations are at this point about what it would be like. Um, I know that some people in this call might have already worked in this kind of context, either in Greece or in another um, similar kind of context in a different country. If this is the case, if you want to just spend these couple of minutes thinking about what your expectations were before you went out and volunteered, then that would be great as well. So we are going to come back and reflect on these at the end of Dan's um, section of the webinar. Um, so if you could just jot these down now, um, we're going to ask some people to share their thoughts um, at the end of the presentations as well. So I'll just give you a minute or two to do that now. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Colette. Um, I've met, I think, all of you before because I invited you here today. Um, so my presentation is about the asylum process. Um, so some things I want to just bring up at the beginning. I am not an expert um, by any stretch of the imagination, but I do have a lot of experience in Greece and the information that I'm giving you today is what I know to be true and it's information that's also been given to me through mobile info team who are the experts so um, a lot of their information from this slideshow is taken from the trainings that they have given in the past. Um, if you want more information I recommend you visit their website. Uh, the two website uh, links are here um, and there's advocates abroad as well who work on Lesbos. So mobile info team is based in the Saloniki where I live um, and they are an organization that help refugees with their asylum claims and cases and they're a very good organization I really do recommend you check out their website. So things to consider. Things are always changing here in Greece. I'm giving you this information um, but unfortunately next week it could be slightly different so that's something to bear in mind what i'm giving you today is a very broad overview i'm not going to go into details um, because i don't feel an expert i don't feel like i can do that um, so i'm just giving you a broad overview today um, new laws are passed regularly especially at this time at the moment because um, about a year ago they had a new government in power in here in Greece and uh, they are well I would call them right wing 
but some people might call them center right. So we won't get into that argument today. <laughs> um, so, you know, some people argue that it's becoming much stricter here in Greece and the, the situation uh, with the refugees um, is becoming a more contentious issue every month. The asylum process is complex and confusing. So if you feel like you have more questions at the end of this than answers, that is totally normal. Um, and my next point is, I will not be able to answer all your questions. Um, and I will be honest with you and say, I'm sorry, that's out of my knowledge and I can't give you that information. Um, again, if you do have those extra questions, I really recommend that you check out Mobile Info Team advocates abroad and also help refugees um, if you check out their website they often do a lot of things with advocacy uh, in Greece so they're the guys to check out if you have questions after this okay so this is the key events um, we don't need to go into too much detail here but basically from March 2016 up until today um, this is considered the start of the refugee crisis, as it's been known, because this is when the borders closed. This is when the bottleneck happened. And a lot of the projects we work with on the ground here, they sprung up in 2016 in response to this crisis. Um, Greece couldn't cope with the numbers. Uh, the situation was uh, perilous in some places, especially along the northern Macedonian border. Um, so in a sense, things have improved in some ways since then, uh, but things are, haven't changed as well. Um, if anything, the projects have adapted, become more stable over time, um, because that's about four years ago now. So things are a lot more secure. So let's just refresh. What do we mean? What is a refugee? Well, under the Geneva Convention of 1951, it's actually very specific. So you must be under these four uh, bullet points. So you must have a well-founded fear of being persecuted. You must have for particular reasons such as race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country of his nationality. So if you're inside your country, then you're an internally displaced person, not a refugee. And finally, is unable or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. So under the convention, a refugee is a very narrow definition. As such, people who we could, would consider needing international protection might not be considered a refugee. Let's talk about an example. People from Afghanistan. When I think of people from Afghanistan, I think, yes, they need to be a refugee. They need to have international protection. However, in some countries, their government is considered to be able to protect them because they have a, an official working government. So they would not fall under the category as refugee because of this fourth bullet point. Um, because they could ask for protection from their government in Afghanistan. Um, these bullet points are interpreted slightly different depending on which country you're in. Some countries interpret them, interpret them very strictly and others less strictly. Um, so if you are not considered a refugee, you can get what's called subsidiary protection. So this is a, um, a category that still gives you international protection or from that nation, but you're not considered a refugee. So you don't get so many rights. So there's two types, <coughs> refugee or um, subsidiary protection. Here's a lovely map of Greece. I just wanted to put, get this up on the screen to point out, you know, what we're dealing with here. So the Saloniki, that's where I live. There is like Northern Greece that has quite a few camps. There's one in Kavala, Ceres. Um, there's one near Edessa as well. Then you have lots of little camps around here, Meteora, Larissa, Ionana. 
there are many camps there. Then we moved down to the south in the Athens area. Um, Athens, like the Saloniki, um, is the capital city, and the Saloniki is the second biggest city in Greece. So you have urban projects there, which work in the city, city limits, but you also have camps. We also have the islands. So Lesbos, Chios, Samos, um, it's not labeled here, but Leros is about where it says Mykonos and Kos. They're considered hot spots. So that's kind of like the first reception centers um, when people come in from the boats from Turkey. We do work with some projects on the islands, but it isn't our main source of projects. So we mainly work with projects in the mainland. There are many reasons for this, but it's mostly because on the front line in the islands, it's emergency relief. And it's very difficult to have um, long-term education, not long-term education projects, that's not correct, but um, consistency of students. There are more pressing issues, you might say, than education on the islands. We certainly do work with some projects there. Okay. So this is the process of um, asylum, and we're going to talk about it on mainland Greece, mainly because I know this process. Um, I, don't, I don't know the process so well on the islands, but it's similar. So we're going to talk about the three sections today. We're going to talk about this uh, blue box here. Uh, we're going to talk about the full registration appointment and then what happens after. So Dublin family reunification and the asylum in Greece pro process. Um, this relocation box here is crossed out because this was an agreement that happened um, up until 2017. Um, this was basically when there was a bottleneck of refugees in Greece and other European countries offered to relocate many of them into their own countries. You remember when Germany admitted many, many thousands of refugees, um, that was about this time. But this stopped under political pressure. So uh, now there are really only two ways that people can be um, either given asylum or um, moved to another country. Okay, so a refugee arrives in Greece. Uh, the first thing that happens is they are detained. Well, if they get detained at the border, they get detained their fingerprints are taken. Um, sometimes people make it as far as the Saloniki, in which case then they would go to the police office themselves and try, you know, and uh, take their fingerprints there. Uh, some people try not to get caught by the police because that means their fingerprints are taken in Greece. And as you might know, um, you have to apply for asylum in the first European country you enter. Uh, so if you get your fingerprints taken in Greece, you pretty much have to have your asylum case dealt with in Greece. So some people try to uh, not get caught. So the next stage is the pre-registration. So this is when you're telling the asylum office of Greece that you intend to apply for asylum. Um, you collect what is called a white card, your fingerprints are taken, your contact details are taken, and you are given an appointment for your full registration interview. So many students are either in one of these three sections. And to be honest, I would say about 50% of your students are probably going to be in this blue box. They've gone to their pre-registration and now they are waiting for their asylum interview. Um, there is a huge issue with this because um, the asylum interview dates, there is a lack of uh, staff in the Saloniki office as well as the Athens one, and they can be waiting up to three years for their full registration appointment. So you might see people with um, cards that have their interview dates. We're looking at like 2022 now. Um, and it really depends your date on where, which country you're from, um, a bit of luck as well, which office you are, you're applying for, if it's Saloniki or Athens. Um, there are many factors that play into it. Um, 
I'll just show you on my next slide. This is a seeking asylum in Greece. This is called a white card. Lots of students will have this. Um, it's basically their like identity card until they get asylum in Greece. You'll see many students with this. The next thing that happens is the full registration appointment. So this is the interview. This is a really important interview. It's a very grueling and intense interview because they are asking you to recount your journey to Greece and the reasons why you're claiming asylum here in Greece. So it's a really tough process, but you have to go through it to claim asylum. Um, they are trying to catch you out. Uh, so you have to be very consistent in what you say. Um, so if you are successful after that interview, then you are granted asylum in Greece. The other thing you can do is this thing called Dublin Family Reunification Process, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is their rights and obligations um, and asylum seekers rights. The kids can go to school. You have the right to work. People have given a cash card by UNHCR. So this gives them a bit of money and this is based on um, family members. So uh, I can't remember the exact figures, but it's about 150 euros per person per month. Um, and accommodation, you have the right to accommodation. So this might be in camps, which could be in ISO boxes, a bit like porter cabins, if you know them from the UK, or that will be in um, rub hall. So it's like a big tent. Um, and facilities very much vary across the different camps. Uh, if you're a vulnerable person, perhaps you're pregnant or you have other needs, you can apply for housing and other organizations do that for you. Um, and the asylum seekers obligations is they cannot leave Greece while the, the application is being processed. Just bear in mind that that process can be up to like four years. So you're not meant to leave Greece for all that time. You must appear at all appointments and interview dates, and you must submit all original documentation. Your rights as a refugee is that you have residence permit for three years uh, duration, which can be renewed and is usually renewed. Um, you have family reunification to Greece, which I'll come to in a minute, and you have travel documents. So this is essentially a passport. Um, you have the right to travel in the Schengen zone for three months out of every six. But the UK is not in the Schengen zone, remember, so people cannot come to the UK without applying for a visa. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is family reunification because you hear about this a lot. This is basically if you have nuclear family in another European country, then you can ask to be reunited with your family members. But it, the criteria is very narrow. Again, it can only be if you have a spouse, a minor child that is under 18, um, and when the applicant is a minor, the person who is responsible for them. So it's great because people can be reunited, but there is a really tight time frame, and also it's only for children under 18. So I've known children that are, they turn 18, their parents can be reunited with their younger brother that's been sent to Germany, but they are stuck in Greece because they cannot be reunited with their family because they're over 18. Um, so there are benefits and disadvantages to this. I have whizzed through that super quickly because I'm aware of the time. Please ask me any questions in the box. I'll do my best to answer what I can. And now I will pass over to Phoebe. So um, I'm going to just spend a little bit of time um, talking about my experiences of volunteering in Athens um, with Project Alea, um, which is based in Eleonis Refugee Camp. So just a quick context of Eleonis Refugee Camp. Um, it was set up in about August of 2015, um, and it's now got about 2,000 um, thereabouts uh, refugees. Um, it's an open structure camp, uh, which means that 
Uh, the residents are free to kind of come and go. There's not any curfews to the camp. Um, so that's the kind of structure of it. Um, a lot of the residents are awaiting family reuni reunification, which obviously Colette's just um, spoken a little bit about. Um, and most of the residents there are from um, Afghanistan, is a large majority, um, Syria as well. Um, there's some from Iraq and also um, there are residents as well from sub-Saharan Africa in the camp um, too. So I was working with, I was volunteering with um, an organisation called Project Alea. Um, I'll just let you read this um, in your own time. This is the kind of aims of Project Alea. Um, the main thing to really emphasise here is that there is a really big focus on improving the quality of life of the residents while they are living in Elionis refugee camp. Um, there's a massive focus on kind of holistic work as well as making sure that residents' time is very productive. Um, so there is education programmes um, and also just making sure that things like the camp itself is a nice place to live and there are things that um, residents of all ages um, can do while they're there. Um, this is just to kind of highlight that there is a big range in what the project does and you will find this with a lot of um, organisations that work with refugees is that they tend to do um, a number of different things um, all at once. So as well as doing some more practical things um, like food and clothing distribution, they also do um, regular activities which I'll talk about in a moment and also lots of kind of um, community-based festivals, so there's, there's lots of talent shows, dance competitions, um, all the religious festivals um, are celebrated, um, and it's all really to make sure that the, the camp as a whole um, really comes together as a community. Um, so this is just a really brief look at the organisational structure um, of Project Talaya. Um, it's very basic because um, Firstly, it's likely to have changed or developed since I was working um, as a volunteer there. And also just to kind of really highlight that every, um, every organisation will do have a slightly different governance structure. But essentially with Project Talaya, um, the kind of senior and more long term volunteers were education um, or project coordinators um, who oversaw um, the kind of teaching side, which is the education side or the more activity-based element of Project Talaya, which was the um, kind of individual activities. Um, again, volunteers who were keen to take a bit more ownership over various activities became kind of activity leaders. And then underneath that, you had your um, kind of regular volunteers who would then get involved with various activities, depending on what they were interested in, their skills, and also how long they were um, volunteering in Athens for. So, what was kind of what's really significant I think with Project Talaya is that volunteers are given quite a, dis a distinct amount of freedom um, in terms of planning the activities that they're involved in and um, the the real caveat to that is that the weekly meetings and the kind of structure of planning which I'll talk about in a moment it was really it's really important that um, those volunteers who are taking part in running activities regularly are able to kind of update the rest of the team on them, reflect on how they're going and give really regular feedback for um, kind of what's happening in those activities every week. Um, the coordinators were usually based, are usually based in the Project Talaya office, which is one of the um, porter cabin containers within the camp. And as well as being really involved in the kind of day-to-day -day volunteering, they also focus a lot on acquiring resources for the camp, um, managing the publicity that comes with um, kind of visits to the camp, um, and also sharing that really in-depth knowledge of the residents that are living in the camp. So if, for example, if you needed, um, or if you wanted to kind of start an activity, then the more senior volunteers would know which residents within the camp kind of had those skills and could be involved. And that final point is something that Project Today really focuses on is this aim to empower the residents themselves. So a lot of the, um, the volunteering is actually done by um, refugees as well. Um, and where appropriate, they kind of lead and have a really big input on um, the way that the project and the activities are run in order to really make sure that it does have a kind of community um, feel to it. So 
I'm just going to talk a bit about the kind of scheduling of day-to-day um, -day activities. So it all centres around, um, or did when I was there at least, around a weekly whole team meeting, which everybody, all the volunteers were expected to attend. And the purpose of this would be to reflect on um, how the previous week's activities have gone, give some updates and feedback and kind of troubleshoot as well. Um, but also it was where volunteers would sign up for the next week's activities in terms of what projects, what, um, what, what activities they were going to lead on. So on the right, this is kind of an example of how the daily activities are allocated. It looks really chaotic with kind of writing everywhere, but actually a lot of these were organized at those weekly meetings. So the, those volunteers who had said that they would be able to commit to taking part in those activities every day, their names would go straight on there every day. And then the daily briefings, which happened um, at the start of the, the sessions, would be for additional volunteers to sign up. Um, and this was really to kind of make sure there was flexibility so you could sign up for as little or as much um, volunteering as you wanted to. And teams would talk on WhatsApp um, and kind of coordinate how they wanted to um, run various, various activities and, and organise them those, themselves. In terms of the timings of the day, um, the teaching will usually happen in the morning. Um, so the English and the German language teaching um, generally happens in the morning and they will be finishing as the rest of the volunteers arrive um, for the afternoon. And we had to be out of the camp by 10.30. So we were generally there for the whole of the afternoon and evening. But as I said, you could kind of sign up to as much or as little as you wanted to throughout that afternoon. And then I've just got some examples of some of the activities that Project Talea focuses on um, for children, teenagers and for adults. Um, there's also ongoing camp improvements. So a big project over the last um, year or so has been last couple of years has been painting all of the containers that the volunteers live in so now the camp is really really colorful so for example if you had a kind of spare hour during the afternoon you could sign up to do painting and you would just chuck some clothes some kind of overalls on and do some painting um, during an hour that you had free so the main um work that I was doing when I was with Project Delay was volunteering with Little School because of my um, primary teaching background. So this was um, something that happened five days a week within the camp um, for children who were kind of preschool age, so they weren't able to go to formal Greek school yet. And it was generally two hours of structured play-based learning. So the idea of this was that we would start with some free play as the children arrived, followed by some songs and a circle time like you can see in this picture here. And then finally, um, we worked, something we worked on while I was there was to kind of make sure that the sessions were more structured with small group activities, similar to what you would have in a kind of nursery or reception um, based school environment where um, children kind of work on an intervention in a small group. And by the end of the week, all children have had a go at taking part in all of the interventions that are being run. And something that we really tried to introduce was having theme based weeks so that the children were building up kind of basic skills like motor skills with cutting and writing and then also basic language and knowledge. And we did this with songs and images and kind of um, stories and things like that. Something I also focused on was trying to introduce some phonics based learning to kind of stretch and challenge the older and more um, academically confident students so that I would take them out and do small phonics based um, interventions. So some of the challenges that really came up with Little School, firstly the language barrier, um, children spoke Farsi, Arabic, French, um, a lot understood basic English but we had to really make sure that we minimised the amount of um, talk and kind of used other means um, to make sure that communication was really clear. Something that you'll hear a lot about as a challenge is the lack of consistency. So this is both in terms of the volunteers. So obviously those more longer term volunteers um, generally led activities and that was to kind of make sure there was consistency. Um, however, obviously that high turnover of volunteers does affect the children's kind of ability to form bonds with volunteers and obviously everyone has slightly different ways of delivering and facilitating which affects consistency um, but also with the children so you can't always guarantee that the same children are going to come um, 
to the sessions every day and that affected things like behavior management and instilling those routines that we really were working to instill with the children um, if they weren't coming every day they were obviously less familiar with those and that in itself was a challenge and um, behavior management as well i had a lot of experience with behavior management teaching um, in the uk but obviously um, it is a different context when, you, when you're in Greece um, children have a lot of trauma and therefore that trauma can then manifest itself in different types of behavior um, sometimes kind of violent behavior between the children um, sometimes in kind of resistance to authority and you know not wanting to form those bonds and interact with others um, so that was definitely something that is a challenge in a kind of little school environment and um, the pitch as well like I said we were working with children between the ages of around three to six so you had the kind of really young children who were just developing those beta basic motor skills right up to those older children who were developing their kind of reading skills and their language skills as well um, resources as well which is something I'll mention more in a moment um, obviously it's a limited resource context so both in terms of um, volunteers kind of contributing their own um, money and resources but also things sometimes going missing because it was a shared space that we were working with um, and then finally disruptions so you know obviously a lot of children within a refugee camp are very bored so some of the older children would come back from school and want to kind of join in with the sessions throw stones at the windows bang on the doors so it was really important to maintain a kind of a really safe space for the children make sure that the, the doors were closed and that we could kind of keep the children entertained throughout their time um, in little school this is just some images of the little school um, kind of building that we were using and this is just really to emphasize that um, the space is was you is used for other things as well so um, kind of yoga women's hour um teaching um there's lots of other kind of uses of that space as well which with it comes its own challenges and um, being able to kind of keep resources safe we spent a lot of time organizing resources and things would get moved or taken so that is definitely a challenge that um, you will find in a lot of teaching um, environments in um, a refugee context we did also have an amazing library container within the camp which i absolutely loved so this is where generally um we kept kind of more expensive books and resources and this was also where a lot of the english teaching would happen um in this smaller space um as well so finally just to kind of talk about some of my highlights i absolutely loved my time um, volunteering with Project Alea, um, both in terms of the um, friends I made, um, volunteers. Um, it was really, really sociable. We would go out for drinks after we finished volunteering at about 10.30. Um, we formed really close um, relationships with a lot of the residents of the camp, a lot of whom, like I said, were also volunteering with the project. They would invite us into their homes, into the containers they were living in, and we'd share food. Um, and they'd come out and celebrate birthdays and things with us um, within the city. Um, the camp itself is amazing. Um, a lot of the projects with Project Delay, like you can see here, have been to make the camp a really pretty, green, um, kind of homely space. Um, it's a very safe camp. I felt really safe walking around it on my own at night, which definitely isn't the same as you'll find in all other contexts, but it was definitely something that I found in Eleonis Refugee Camp. And yeah, generally it was just amazing to kind of see the confidence of the children that I was working with in little school and in the other activities that I was doing, really developing confidence and kind of start to come out of their shells and feel really settled um, within the obviously really challenging environment that they were in. So that's a kind of whistle stop um, tour about Project Alea. Um, that's probably brought up lots of questions. So like we said, please feel free to um, pop those in the box and then um, we'll kind of look at them at the end. So I will now pass over to Dan, who's going to talk about his experiences in Greece. So I will stop sharing my screen now. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna try and be as quick as possible because I appreciate many of you will probably have loads of questions and I wanna make sure as many of you can get them in before the end of the session. So let's begin. Can you all see my screen? Just give me a thumbs up. Awesome. 
Okay, um, so I worked in a city environment. So my charity was SOS Refugiados. It's a Spanish charity and it was um, based in Spain and a lot of re uh, volunteers and resources would come out to Athens, which was where it was based and kind of serve the local community. So I'll give you a bit more context. It was based near the center of Athens and it catered to a lot of the families living in and around the city center, but it did get sort of um, communities from the more the periphery of the city and it the building sort of served loads of different purposes it didn't just do education it catered for food healthcare, immigration advice and loads of other services so many people would be coming there for all sorts of reasons and that is actually reflected in many of the roles that you'll be asked to take on if you were to work in a place like that so even if you went there for example i went as an educational specialist i also did other things alongside that because that was just the requirements of the sort of um, volunteer placement um, here's just a very brief schedule of what a typical day would look like. We would usually work Monday to um, Friday, but Friday would be like a half day and it would really be any school done that day. You'd just literally be doing things like healthcare and handing out supplies. So in the morning, we'd always have to start with a meeting, just detail what was going on, who was doing what, because um, jobs weren't stationary. The people who were leading the whole project, um, who were the founders of the charity, were permanent members but everyone sort of below them was coming on a volunteer basis. And the more senior volunteers were people who had just sort of been there longer than everyone else. Um, in the morning were loads of the children's classes, then you'd have lunch, and in the afternoon, many of the teachers who did the children's class would like swap over to do the adult classes, while other volunteers who weren't sort of teaching specialists would go off and take the kids to the park. At the end, we'd have an afternoon meal at the end of the day, then we'd all just clean up the whole center. So it was sort of a really um, full on day. So, you know, nine till five ish sort of every day is that Friday. Um, so here is just a brief outline of the class structure. So it was sort of split into two main groups. The first part was um, children. That was anyone really between four and 12. And they were sort of just lumped into one um, group. And then you had the adults, so sort of teenagers and older. So the differentiation within the room was quite difficult at times, obviously, because the needs in the room are quite varied. Um, but I will say with the children, you would get a lot more support from other volunteers and the ratios of adult to children would be far higher than you would in the adult class, something that I've quickly touched upon later. So um, I'm just going to go into the challenges and the sort of pros of sort of working, the children, working with the children in that environment. In terms of behaviour management, you are more likely to see sort of challenge in behaviour and um, you're going to have to use sort of trauma-informed tactics to sort of quell that sort of behaviour just because at times it can be quite disruptive to your class. Um, another thing that was also mentioned in the previous one, so I'll only talk about it briefly, is just resources. When you're teaching, a lot of the time, you know, you could plan an amazing lesson, but then things may not work out, there may not be paper, the prints may not be working, things like that. So that could be another sort of challenge in working in that environment. And finally, just um, many of the children have differing ranges of sort of having been to school. So some are um, more sort of um, ready for going to school and they've just had more experience of it and others, it may be their first time. So, you know, a lot of the classroom culture and getting them ready to sit down and learn is a lot more difficult and requires a bit more practice. But in terms of the pros, um, because the environment is less structured than I would say school is in this country, it means that the creativity and sort of the ideas you can run with with the class are a lot higher. And I would say um, that really runs into the level of support because you have more adults with you. It means you can do sort of more interesting stuff with the children and they can do more creative activities, which is really nice. Um, and compared to the adult classes, you'll find that there's a high level of consistency of attendance, which just feeds into sort of um, the progress you can make with the children, just because a lot of parents will use the classes for sort of daycare, as well as, um, you know, sending their children to get um, sort of an education of sorts. So, you know, the same children you'd often see come through every single day. So you'd actually see them start to progress, which was really nice to be able to do. Um, I just put a quick snapshot of a children's classroom. So this um, it would be was the standard children's classroom. As you can see, it's quite a small room and that space was used for around 30 children. So when I talk about being able to manage a space and having to use your resources as best you can, 
that's the sort of challenge you may have to face in a center where there's loads of different activities going on and you sort of have to just juggle and do as best you can with what you've got so that is sort of the um, children classroom environment if we move on to the adults um, unlike the children more sporadic attendance just many adults who um, come to the class often have to manage it between work and other commitments so you may not have the same students attending all the time so there may have to be catch-up sessions and other things just to kind of keep everyone up to speed of what's going on um, there's sometimes like different um, culture shocks just in the way some people are used to having gone to school and it can mean that you sort of have to negotiate the rules of how you want to run your classroom each time just to make sure everyone's on the same page and one thing with um, the way the volunteering worked in the center was a lot of people were taking over from the previous volunteer who'd run the class and as you many of you will know different teachers tend to have different rules and conventions in their classroom and different classroom cultures would often mean um, some students would sort of be like oh well we're used to learning this way no we're used to learning this way so you kind of have to constantly sort of renegotiate that and have very clear rules of how you want learning to look like in your classroom uh, pros though um, start from the bottom this time higher accountability in that many of the people who take part in the classes are doing it to um, for a specific purpose whether that's going for an interview whether that's to get a job so a lot of the time they are far more willing to kind of ask for homework um, they want more feedback they really want to progress as quickly as possible so it means you can really see the progress in a slightly different way than with the children where you don't have to be like can you please do your work now um, limited behavior management also as a result just because the people who are going to the class pretty much all want to be there and no one's being made to go by their parents and often you can really draw on the multilingual aspect of many of the students I remember there were many people I taught who spoke four or five languages and often can work as an interpreter for other students in your class so you, um, it's a really good resource to use for other people in the classroom to help improve your practice I just give you an example of this was what um, one of the adult ESL classes would look like. At the front you have two facilitators who are sort of um, teaching at the front of the classroom and it would sort of be um, sorted into advanced, intermediate and beginner classes and different um, facilitators with sort of different levels of English would um, take different classes. Um, because many of the volunteers in this um, charity were Spanish, um, it tended to be English speaking ESL teachers would sort of do the advanced upper intermediate classes and um, the Spanish teachers would end up doing a lot of the more beginner classes. Okay, I will just quickly go to this. This is just sort of a quick outline of just um, some fun highlights of what I did when I was out there. Um, if you look at the bottom left, top right, that's just an example of sort of the whole team getting together to help do a massive supply drop off. So no matter what everyone does in the center, on a Friday, the big truck would come with all the resources and the expectation would just be that, you know, you pitch in, help out, takes about half an hour, just get everything off the truck, chip in and get it into the center. Um, the middle is um, just us taking the kids to the park. So it's just a different side to volunteering, which is sort of the fun, creative aspect. And um, top left was one of the um, ESL classes I used to take for adults. So as you can see, there's only two people in that class. So you get the complete opposite of what you got with the children where there's like 30 of them in one room. You can have like really small classes where you can really focus on different, um, different adults and sort of support them. And you know, you get to see greater progress and you get to build more of a relationship with them because you know, there's only two people. So yeah, that's me. And just before we finish, there's just a couple of things that I'd just like to pose to you. Um, the first thing I'd like to look at is how have your expectations changed after hearing about the various refugee contexts? So that's your first question. And then I just, after this, write two things that you would do to support learning. Now, this can be in your role as um, an educational specialist, whether you're going to be a leader in any other way. Just what two things do you think you could do in order to promote learning in your role? So we're going to give about two minutes to do that and then we're going to round off with a Q&A and then, yeah. So I will go up to the top. Um, Anna Jackson first wrote, high turnover, turnover mm -hmm. of volunteers, so little continuation of knowledge, best practice, limited access to materials, mm -hmm. technology. Is this a question 
or is I think that was I think that was in response to um, thinking about what their initial ideas are um, in the first question. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, indeed, so, all of those things are correct. <laughs> um, I would say limited access to materials. This is an interesting one. I mean, if you're talking about materials in terms of textbooks and you're talking about materials in terms of interactive whiteboards, then absolutely. But some projects vary in terms of how much materials they've got, which are very paper-based, which are very kind of kinetic um, game-based. So they might have lots of flashcards, they might have lots of memory games that they've collected over the years. Um, but that does vary from project to project. Um, Kristen asks, so there is not one asylum process for all of Greece? Yes, Kristen, essentially there is one asylum process for the whole, all of Greece, but how that, is, um, how that is acted upon is slightly different depending whether you're on the mainland or on the islands. For example, in the, in the islands, they tend to deal with your case um, in a reception center, um, in, a, in a refugee camp on the islands called the hotspots. Whereas on the mainland, it's, um, you can, it's a lot of traveling. You might be in an Athens office, you might be in the Saloniki office, um, and it's not within the camp in which you reside. Um, so essentially the, the islands can be quicker, they can also be slower, um, but essentially it's the same process. Um, Andrew asks, are all the staff including based in Greece, volunteers. So are all the staff in Greece, volunteers? Um, Dan, would you like to answer that? Um, so no, it's a bit of a mix. So often the people who I found run a lot of the projects have relocated to Greece and they've decided, <clears throat> and they've decided to live there. However, many of the people who are sort of the everyday on the ground volunteers are often volunteers from either abroad or internally within Greece, or they're refugees within the camps who've decided to volunteer as well. Yeah, many people um, are on a stipend. So not many people, the coordinators might be on a stipend, but most of the volunteers uh, are self-funding themselves. Um, this is for you, Phoebe. Ch children can go to school, but not all do. Little school at Project Alea is one intervention to replace the school? So um, generally little school was there to support the children who were preschool age. So I think, um, Colette, you can correct me, is it, is it it's six or seven that they can go to um, kind of proper formal school in Greece. Um, so our function with little school was to kind of support that um, preschool learning that a lot of Greek children might have in a different setting or in, or in a private nursery, for example, that the residents of the camp don't have access to. Um, but then alongside that, we kind of ran other activities for when the children got back from school, um, like the arts and crafts or the sports and games sessions or the girls Zumba where we kind of, they did dancing. And they were for when the children weren't at school and they were like additional activities to kind of keep them busy and happy um, and productive within the camp. Yeah and as you say Kristen children can go to school but not all do. Um, if you remember back to asylum seeking rights people are at different stages of the asylum process uh, which can affect their ability to attend school. Uh, bureaucracy and attendance procedures uh, can be slow uh, so even though the children are entitled to go to school, some don't for various reasons. Um, how long do volunteers normally stay? Dan and Phoebe, you might have a different perspective on this. So, yeah. Do you want to go first, Phoebe, then I'll go after? Uh, yeah, I was just, I think, yeah, it's a, re it's a really good question. I think it really varies. I think, like Dan said, generally those in a coordinator role or kind of leaders, those in leadership within an organisation, uh, for Project Talaya, um, like Dan said, they had relocated to Greece and were also self-funded, but living in Greece and volunteering and they weren't being paid. So various, they would kind of supplement their income in various ways, either by leaving for a couple of months and earning or kind of doing other paid tutoring and things um, in Greece alongside it. So there were some volunteers who had been in um, 
Athens for several years or um, at least a year. Um, generally, Project Alea has a, min a real minimum of three weeks that they ask volunteers to stay for to try and minimise that high turnover. Um, I would say about the average when I was there was between one and three months. Um, I think there are a lot of Spanish volunteers and there still are a lot of Spanish volunteers with Project Alea and they would generally stay for a couple of months at least. And a lot of the time volunteers will go and come back. So if they're university students, they might come every summer for two or three months um, and kind of come as regularly as they can. Did you have the same situation as well, Dan? Um, yeah, very similar. Um, I, the, the shortest period of time I've saw a volunteer sort of um, volunteer for was maybe two weeks. But that was like a really one off just because there was no other way they could do the sort of um, volunteer position. But generally, I found it was a month or more. Mm. But the one thing that I will say is some people would volunteer for a month, but that wouldn't be consistently at one place. It may be a couple of weeks here and a couple of weeks in another volunteering organisation. So it doesn't necessarily mean the same place all the time. Mm. And uh, the minimum stay varies from project to project and it uh -huh. usually depends on the service they provide. So if you're working with an organisation that does distribution um, and is more involved perhaps on the health healthcare side of things, their minimum stay will be shorter than an organisation that um, does education generally um, and some have fixed terms. Um, Anna asks, when it comes to trauma-informed teaching, what are the key interventions and principles you find most helpful? We have another question on this. Can you say more about trauma-informed behaviour management? Um, is there a short-term online tr training on trauma-informed teaching you can recommend? I'm going to bracket those all together and say, personally, I'm not an expert on trauma-informed. Dan or Phoebe, are you, have you got prior training? Uh -huh. I didn't have prior training on tra trauma-informed teaching, no. I've just seen someone has highlighted that Future Learn do a course, which I was going to say as well, there's a really good course on teaching in a refugee context. So I'd recommend that it's free on Future Learn. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't have any previous experience. Again, um, I think... Yeah. Like, I don't know what your thoughts are. I'm, I, again, I think it varies in how much support as well is offered by... Um, an organisation who you're working with in terms of trauma-informed teaching. I think obviously for a lot of people, if they're doing young adults or adults teaching English, it can be less of an issue during the sessions versus working with young children where it does come out more visibly within the sessions. Um, yeah. I found that it was kind of learning from experience and taking what I knew about teaching in a UK-based context and kind of always knowing that there's a context to behaviour and it doesn't happen in a vacuum and therefore making sure rea your reaction to it is reflective of that um, was something that helped me a lot. Um, I, I won't go like too much into it but it, it runs along the similar lines of children in the UK with challenging behaviour yeah. it just sort of has to sort of accommodate for the fact that they don't necessarily have stability of the same teacher in the same school at the same time that's one of the biggest things within trauma-informed teachers, kind of understanding that sort of their attachment to their teacher and stable environments is so affected by having to move around a lot, which means that you have to sort of, the biggest thing I would argue is like being able to preempt this point where you know something will set that child off or set that person off. So it might mean providing them choices of what they want to do as an activity. Instead of saying, we're doing this now and trying to force them down particular routes. And then, the f without going into more on that but the flip side is unlike teaching where like you know you do your job you have a good day you go home there's a sort of just that sort of um looking after yourself because a lot of the time a lot and refugee ed is really good at doing this in that you know after you do your whole um volunteering stint you do get sort of a call and to kind of debrief you and you can have access to sort of counseling and stuff if you need it um, it is the whole taking care of yourself, which is the other half of trauma-informed teaching, because a lot of what they call like the allostatic load, so all the stress and that, that you witness and that you are amongst while you teach, often rubs off on you. And even if you don't perceive it as having an effect on you, it does. And it's very important that you understand that it's okay that these things affect you and that you take steps to sort of 
minimize its effect on your life and your relationships and your interactions with other people but yes I think as well the the last thing I'd add is that routine is just another big factor I think to support children with trauma is just you know people find safety in routines so having really simple routines that especially if you're working with young children that you can implement every day makes them feel kind of safe and and they feel like they're in a more reliable and consistent environment but I can see people are putting lots of um links to kind of um courses that you can do and a youtube video as well from um refugee ed about trauma teaching so there are some really useful resources out there and i of course would really recommend the video by refugee ed yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i'm being totally serious it's done by a woman who was in greece and so it's totally um focused on the context um and very understanding of the lack of knowledge that volunteers often come into this environment so Phoebe and Dan both had um, experience in schools. However, many volunteer teachers, um, especially working with adults as well, let's not forget about the trauma-informed practices for them, uh, they might not have any teaching background whatsoever. Um, so, I, wait, I saw another question about this. Um, yeah, I just put in the a chat box a, another Future Learn course, which is directly about trauma-informed mm. teaching. There are a couple more which I can send to you on emails, guys, um, after. Um, Ginny asks, Dan, did the six to 12 year olds not go to Greek school? Um, so, now this is the part that kind of feeds into what Colette was saying about before people get asylum and that sort of iffy sort of place when it comes to being in contact with organizations which sort of symbolize authority like schools. Um, for many for many families, it is the case that they'd love for their children to go to school. However, they don't send them because they perceive, um, sometimes quite rightly, that that would have negative consequences for them in terms of their ability to stay in Greece. So, y yes, some children who do come and seek refuge, like, do go to school, but many don't because their parents just don't want to risk it. Yeah, many of them consider Greece a stepping point or stepping stone into Europe, it's not their final destination. Um, okay, let's move on. Um, can you say more about trauma? Right, okay. Um, do volunteers receive safeguarding and TIP training prior to arrival in Greece? I have to say, I'm not sure what the acronym TIP is. Sorry for my ignorance. Is it trauma informed? Ah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, again, really varies by organisation. I would say majority no, but the volunteers would have to sign a conduct, code of conduct and a safeguarding document, and they will be taken for an induction. Um, how rigorous that induction is really depends on um, uh, each project. Uh, but in terms of my project, I did get a good induction and we always made sure that our volunteers had good inductions in terms of like um, your etiquette and your behaviour in the camp, in terms of forming relationships. I don't mean obviously a sexual relationship, I mean even a friendship with someone and you're leaving after four weeks can be incredibly damaging to that individual who is unable to leave. So all of that uh, kind of volunteer behaviour um, and responsibility should be covered in an induction. Phoebe and Dan, what was your experiences of your induction process? Yeah, I think there was a lot of emphasis on kind of um, appropriate, exactly like you said, collect appropriate um, kind of conduct in the camp. So obviously really basic things like not asking residents, you know, what was your experience or what was your journey and, and not kind of, and yeah not asking those kinds of evasive questions how to go about having conversations in a different way um and also i think just generally because a lot of the volunteers were also residents in the camp that was a, a really kind of nice way to be inducted into the situation because the residents themselves could talk to you quite honestly about things and like and kind of how to go about um volunteering um i think equally though a lot of it was learning 
on the on the job in a way um but i believe that that has developed more since i was there um and there are lots more um training sessions and courses uh, a lot of the senior coordinators are um qualified in various um qualifications including kind of dealing with trauma and therapy and things so that really helps um with that kind of side of things as well um, from my perspective mine was very much a hands-off approach um the day i arrived not many people knew i was supposed to be coming that sort of thing except for the contact who was sort of based online for me so for me a lot of it was sort of speaking to people and being quite proactive about the approach sort of saying what is your policy here what do you do and kind of being able to ask those questions and when you do go there you'll find that people are very willing to talk to you but I would just stress like being a volunteer in those contexts it does require to be more proactive than you would do in a volunteering context in say the UK because it's not like necessarily people will go out and ask you do you know this thing it's the expectation that if you don't know that you ask because people have a million and one things to do and that sort of stuff so but that was just my experience yeah we also had quite a rigorous document that we were sent in advance um which kind of went through different areas including dress code and kind of how to because that is quite important as well in a refugee camp and kind of looked at lots of different um elements of um kind of what it would be like to be a volunteer as well yeah great points guys Really good. Okay, Ryan's got a great question. So thanks, Phoebe and Dan. Really interesting to hear your experiences teaching uh, in those contexts. I'm about to start supporting volunteer teachers at an NGO remotely, and I'm just thinking about what support I could provide their new volunteers, uh, possibly with short information videos. Uh, this is a bit of a general question, but what do you wish you knew, or what information do you wish you had at your disposal before you began volunteering in Greece? a curriculum <laughs> like when you go in like i can't stress enough the, f the the lack of structure sometimes you go in with it's helpful to have structures that you can bring to bear without having to go and create everything from scratch so if you have sort of things that you can just sort of pick from feed into it's much easier to kind of get moving instead of having to think about creating a billion and one resources or you know organizational structures to get a project going or something yeah so curriculum for me knowing where to start <laughs> yeah i think for me um it would definitely be i think we both touched on it a bit is knowing that there are so many things that you will get involved with or you can get involved with alongside the educational aspect um so for example the teachers that um were volunteering with project to layer would often stay on in the afternoon and get involved in other activities as well. And I think kind of having that understanding that organisations are likely to be covering quite a lot of things at once and actually there's really exciting different things that you can get involved in. I mean, there's not much you can prepare for in advance, but it's, it's good to know, I think, um, so that you kind of have a good understanding of what um, the context is um, with, with NGOs in Greece. Um, that's quite a general one, but I think Dan's probably got a, a better one in terms of teaching just because I was working with younger children rather than teaching English. Nice. Um, okay, uh, Ellen, you made a really nice comment about, um, you know, the joyous experiences of working on the ground in Greece. And I think it's testament to how many volunteers extend their stays in Greece. Most people only go for, you know, expecting to go for only three weeks a month, myself included, three months turned into six and turned into nine, which is now nearly at two years. So, um, <laughs> you know, people really enjoy this experience. Um, and absolutely, trust building activities, setting a good relationship. Yeah, that's really, really important. Um, Kristen says those two things depend on concrete work. Yeah, okay, so the kind of what, what you would do to support learning. Um, Anna, through ideas, knowledge, and best practice sharing and collaboration. Yes, I love collaboration. That sounds great to me. Um, Jack says provide a variety of fun and classroom management techniques. 
yeah, with little or no resources. Excellent. Best practice again by Gabrielle. And oh yeah, learning diaries. Okay, which could include a log of theme lessons that if completed. Great idea. And uh, something we can talk about more, which some projects tried to implement in the north. It didn't take off, but um, it could be something to bring up again. Um, Abby asks to you both, did you both self-fund your time in Greece? How much is needed for living costs? Uh, I fundraised. So I fundraised for my flight and I um, worked the, sum the summer before that to kind of pay for everything in terms of what I would be spending personally while I was in Greece. But I different people did different things, yeah. Yeah, I self-funded um i think living costs in like athens greece in general is really cheap obviously um and i think there are ways as well that you can keep costs down something that we did a lot of was we bought food in the camp so there were residents who set up little businesses cooking and selling food within the camp um and they would sell that and we would we would eat that every day which was nice because obviously you're supporting residents businesses and you're kind of having really delicious um cheap meals every day um i think yeah obviously if you're not working there is a significant cost needed mainly for accommodation but i think day-to-day -day, um living can be done really really cheaply speaking on accommodation where i actually was um based um they had a sort of a way for you to stay in sort of a hostel which was like the top floor and that was like volunteers who absolutely had nowhere to stay sort of no plan or anything like that they did have like a few bunks and that that you know you could stay for two or three days while you kind of got yourself sorted so you know a lot of them are really sort of accommodating for sort of volunteers who have really just done everything they can to get out there and you know yeah to help you out yeah and um for anybody that's thinking about coming out to Greece, many times um, I know people that did crowdfunders on GoFundMe or something or just giving. Um, and people are really, really uh, motivated to give money because they see that their money will actually result in something that they can tangibly see. For example, you going to Greece to help a project. So um, I would recommend doing it that way. Do you have any concerns about um, money? Um, Anna asks, do classes include aspects of skills such as critical thinking, communication, and learning to learn? I would say that that depends on the teacher and depends on um, how much experience that teacher is coming into the classroom with. Um, if it's a volunteer teacher that doesn't know um, basically anything about teaching, they would probably just focus on the content of the classes. What do you think, Phoebe and Dan? Did you just repeat the question again? <laughs> so I just, I didn't, the, the first bit cut out for me. Okay, do classes include aspects of skills such as critical thinking, communication, learning to learn, etc.? Um, uh, with the adults, I would say yes. You know, you did do sort of like a bit of stuff on revision skills and metacognition and you know just ways to keep notes and that but with the younger children it was more just you know your bog standard ESL teaching and you know just keeping it creative and fun just because you just need to keep them engaged so it was less of the sort of this is a way you can revise and that sort of stuff. Yeah we brought it in in different se sessions actually so for example the teen time we really developed the teen time sessions to be a space for teenagers to uh, come together and have those critical thinking sessions so there would be a topic or a theme and there would be resident volunteers translating into Farsi and Arabic as well um, translating into English and Farsi and Arabic um, and that the idea of those sessions was to develop critical thinking and communication skills because obviously a lot of those teenagers were missing out on those kind of a safe space for those sessions to happen in school because uh, they were learning in a Greek school and it wasn't kind of their their first language or an environment they felt as comfortable in um, but yeah I'd agree with Dan I think with the younger children it was definitely the main absolute main focus was just instilling a routine um, making sure that the children were happy 
and kind of giving them some an opportunity for some to gain some basic skills that they would have otherwise had in in preschool great um ellen's got a great question do any of the charities enable the people who live in the camps often for years to run the education activity schemes i imagine there'll be a number of teachers nursery nurses artists gardeners engineers etc amongst the population whose talents could be used or are there legislative reasons why these people can't be employed in such roles? Um, I would just not say employed uh, because most projects don't have enough money to pay people. So they could be volunteered. They could be volunteers in such roles. And it does happen. Absolutely, it does. Um, yeah, we had, yeah, we had loads of, like I said, loads of residents who were volunteers. Some of our teachers were, um, refugees who had been teachers of English um, when before they kind of came to Greece so they would do often the highest level of teaching because they had the most experience and they were obviously there for a longer term um, similar with the gardening and the engineering there's obviously an amazing range of skills that um, the residents have but yeah like Colette said there was no way that we could pay them. So they, a big focus was kind of trying to encourage them to use their skills so they could then talk about that in a job interview. And part of what Project Delay does is it does also work with kind of increasing their opportunities for employment. So a lot of the senior coordinators will spend time gaining partnerships or apprenticeships with um, organizations within Athens to try and secure them jobs. But Unfortunately, yeah, the charities can't pay the volunteers. Yeah, same story. I mean, I met a couple and they were both nuclear physicists. So they um, literally started teaching like chemistry clubs and stuff like that just to kind of get something on their CV. So even if it's not like sort of financial sort of benefits from doing sort of work with the charities, they can at least get volunteering experience, which does count for quite a lot if you can't sort of get a proper employment yet. Mm. Yeah, and I would just add that sometimes, even though these people are very highly skilled, they're going for an incredibly difficult time in their lives and they find it, even if they've been offered the work, they find it really difficult to be consistent in that work, perhaps due to uh, commitment or, you know, just having a bad day. So it's really important that projects um, are understanding of those situations. And unfortunately, some people do have work, don't get me wrong, but uh, sometimes that can be a barrier to employment. It's just because they can be so up and down some days, just because it, it's, it's not a good day for them. Um, Ellen asks, how closely do the charities work with local agencies with regard to child safeguarding? Is there a multi-agency approach at all? Okay, so in the camp setting, um, you have camp coordination meetings and all actors within the, within the camp will work together. If you have a concern of a safeguarding, a child safeguarding issue, you report it to the protection team of uh, the bigger NGO who can then refer it to the child protection uh, unit. So in that sense, yes, there is a multi-agency approach to it. That's what works in the camps because they are kind of a unit that work together. I have less experience in the urban centres, um, but I imagine it somewhat works the same. There will be agencies that work together, especially on kind of sh child safeguarding issues. Uh, Phoebe and Dan, do you know how your projects worked? Yeah, similar to, as you said, if we, we'd report a safeguarding issue to um, one of the coordinators who was in charge of safeguarding and similar to the UK you make you have to make sure you write it down really clearly um, kind of word for word if possible or if there are injuries etc um, and then they would take that to um, like you said a kind of senior NGO um, within the camp um, we did obviously have a there was a police unit in the camp they, they, they didn't kind of patrol they were just on the, the edge of the camp um, I don't know what their level of involvement was but yeah I think generally it was much more that the project will then take it onto a um, larger NGO who will then kind of move forward with dealing with it. Yeah they should refer it to uh, well there's different organisations that yeah. work on child safeguarding issues. 
varies yeah. slightly depending on the camp. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was very similar for me. It's sort of a lot of it. It a lot of it was done in house, but if it was quite a serious thing, it would kind of be given up, that taken up to the sort of headquarters, and then they decide whether they need to get local authorities involved and this, that, and the other. And it was kind of taken above your head. So. Mm -hmm. Um, Andrew asked, does refugee ed have a child protection policy, um, and how is it implemented? Um, we don't have the child protection policy because we don't deal with beneficiaries directly. We encourage the projects to have child protection policies if they don't already have so. Um, but it is something that some projects need to work on. Uh, we have a safeguarding document and a code of conduct instead. Gretchen asks, how communicative are the organisations about their projects, goals and strategies? Do they formally evaluate their projects? uh not in the way that you would ex not no not in the same way that you would have like a yearly reports from a an organization or a charity in the uk kind of with statistics um no i think kind of the communication for example with project to layer is more to do with well there's communication with a kind of from a journalism perspective and gaining publicity for the organization in order to be able to build it further. Um, I think in terms of evaluation of the project that there is a real aim to do that weekly with the meetings to really continuously evaluate um, how successful the projects are and making sure that there's a purpose to the activities and that the, that the residents of the camp are kind of gaining something or benefiting from them. Um, but in terms of formal evaluation, no, but I do know that we, the project gained things, for example, like an ideas box from um, Libraries Without Borders, which is a, an amazing organisation. And the way that they gained that ideas box, which has all this technology with it, was that they did have to present a huge report with kind of what the impact of the project had been and how they would use that in the future. So again, some of the more senior volunteers do work on that, but yeah, it's not, there's not kind of impact measuring as the, in the same way as you would have um, in other contexts. Yeah, I would say that it really varies on project. Uh, again, it would never be so um, formal, but n some projects have a headquarters in another country, so they are being evaluated uh, on from their headquarters, uh, and they would be a registered charity in another country, so they do have to produce, um, you know, uh, annual reports and things like that. Um, many of the organizations have a mission statement, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and a strategy of going forward. Um, but it does the vary on the project, project to project. What was it like for you, Dan? Um, very, um, very similar to what you just talked about, because the project I worked with was a Spanish charity. So although we were sort of on the, the ground in terms of what we saw, a lot of that information would be fed to the coordinator who was permanently based in the country would then feed it off to the head office and they would sort of do the impact measurement and sort of measure the statistics of how effective we were being but that didn't necessarily always get communicated back to us on the ground of like how well are we doing our job so it's often sort of a one-way sort of feedback no is it even feedback one-way communication sort of and then if you are really good and you know someone in the office you can kind of go you know that meeting we had last week what was the outcome and then that's sort of the way it works that's how it shouldn't work but unfortunately <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it does i'm really sorry but i'm gonna have to go pretty much soon to 8 6 30 in greece um so i'm gonna fly through these last couple of questions i'm gonna i'm gonna say like dan phoebe me so let's go cool. um, is there any potential for online teaching alongside the volunteers work or would this not be practic uh, practicable? Um, essentially, yes and no, but essentially no. Uh, Wi-Fi is very bad in the camps and people have limited data. They have been trying to do online classes uh, because of COVID-19, but um, these classes are not just about education. It's about the contact with an individual mm -hmm. and the relationships you form. So they haven't been very successful. Um, 
Okay, how has COVID-19 impacted on the work on the ground in previous months and what are things looking like at the moment? Pretty positive here at the moment. Uh, we can go to the bars and the restaurants and uh, I'm teaching again in my uh, language academy. Um, as projects are starting to open up their projects again and their classes. So slowly, slowly things are getting back to normal. Um, until travel restrictions are lifted, how will all of this work while volunteers are working remotely? Uh, well, pe volunteers are coming in now, actually. Um, and you, I just saw a message. You can come from the 15th of June, guys. Come on, come with us. Come to Greece. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, essentially it's been tough. Um, the engagement has been quite low. Um, but you will be working remotely with a project and we can talk about that um, when I kind of get in touch with you about how I think that you could help and where your role might be. And finally, uh, thinking back to what Dan said about needing a curriculum, how far do projects have set programs that they ask volunteers to work within in terms of a curriculum and resources? I'm going to ask both Dan and Phoebe to reflect on what their experience was like on this. Um, for me, mine didn't. So I kind of had to sort of put one together while I was there um, and then kind of sort of leave one in place. But I understand because I have a friend who went there last year, the year after me, that things have improved and they have more of a sort of curriculum that they are working off now. Um, yeah, I wouldn't know massively about the adult kind of English language teaching side of the project um, but with the little school um, no we kind of set out a medium term one um, just in terms of what we think we thought we should focus on and a kind of logical order to that and then that's hopefully something that's been followed on by um, subsequent volunteers in the same position. Yeah, it again varies on projects. I would say that the best way for projects in this context is to have a um, a bare bones curriculum. So you kind of go by themes um, and you have them by levels. I always recommend that organisations have levels, so level one to four, level one to six. Um, but in terms of classroom um, structures, and how they plan their class, that can be given relative freedom depending on the teacher. Um, other projects might have very strict, uh, like six week programs that they run through and the volunteer teachers have to stick to those. Again, it's depending on the project, but kind of a, a bare bones curriculum with some themes that people should work towards and some grammar points, if we're talking about ESL at least, grammar points within those themes that they should be working towards really helps volunteers. Um, and I think Dan would agree with you that it would have been really helpful for him to have something like yeah. that to start with as a starting point. Um, so we have run over and it's now, I do unfortunately have to go, but that's probably best because we could talk about this all day. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for everybody coming. Thank you, Dan and Phoebe. I've been doing a lot of talking, but really it was these guys that did most of the hard work. So uh, round of applause to them. <laughs> thank you, Dan and Phoebe. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Really useful to them. Yeah. <laughs>